what I want to talk about is not necessarily kind of the orthodoxy of activism, but instead I want to have like a challenging conversation about some of the limitations of protest and the future of protest. So um, some of the things I'm going to say definitely for some people I think are going to ruffle your feathers, but then I, I've always found that the best ideas in my life are the ones that are most productive in my life are the ones that like make me uncomfortable. So rather than like rebelling against those feelings, I think it's cool to like take a note of it and try to understand like why did that particular thing that I heard or whatever um, bother me so much and what can I make of that? So um, just first some personal context because I, as I continue to grow older as an activist, I realized that um, there are some things that are quite different about me. First, first of all, the number one thing is that I've been an activist my entire life. So literally, I started doing activism when I was 13 years old. It's the only thing I've ever done. I've never had a non-activist job. The only job I really ever had was at a magazine called Adbusters, um, writing articles about activism. And so when I was very young, when I was 13 years old, I did my first campaign, which was to um, refuse to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance in my public school, which is a campaign that actually a lot of young activists start with. I have now seen this. If you every year or something, there's another activist who starts by not standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and then, it then every year I did more and more. So um, some of the things that I did is I sued my school um, with the ACLU when I was in high school against <coughs> drug testing of student athletes. Then when I went to college, my um, sophomore year was 9-11, and I started one of the nation's first like, student anti-war organizations. Then I dropped out of college and I went to Palestine with the International Solidarity Movement in the West Bank and did direct action nonviolence. Um, then I went to Zimbabwe and I did peace action. So the point is that when I was young, I decided that I was going to do this thing, which is that I was going to have the ultimate activist pedigree and just like, just do all of the uh, insane things. So when I got back from Palestine, I was a big fan of this magazine called Adbusters, and I ended up like writing to them and pretending as if I was going to be, just happened to be in Vancouver, could I intern there? And they said yes, and then I moved to Vancouver and worked there. <laughs> and it was amazing, and I, you know, and I worked my way up Eventually, because I was an illegal immigrant, I had to leave, but um, I worked my way up through making myself useful to the magazine. This is why I became a writer, is to work at Adbusters magazine, um, and became an editor and worked my way to the highest levels. Long story short, when I was 28, um, I was working at Adbusters, and you know, the, the Arab Spring erupts. Okay? So in January, and, um, you know, the end of 2010 and the beginning of 2011, the Arab Spring erupts in, 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 first in Tunisia and then spreads to Egypt. And I had lived in Egypt for about nine months, like a couple years before, and I had seen how, like it, when I was there, like literally, like they would just have like dozens and dozens of police officers just like standing on the streets, like, you know what I mean? Like, like the, the idea of protest in Egypt was like impossible, and the idea that Mubarak would step down, also impossible. So when Mubarak did step down, um, and I was working at Adbusters, I immediately was on the phone with, with Kala, the founder, of, the founder of Adbusters, and being like, this is like a revolutionary moment. And everyone in America at that time was like, this is not a revolutionary moment, because we live in this bubble in America. And in May, the protests then spread to Spain. And the people of Spain started going into their squares, and they did something differently. They started having these consensus-based assemblies. Um, and if you go back and look at those pictures, they're amazing. You know, you have thousands and thousands of people in these squares doing all of these kind of consensus-based um, decision-making processes. And so, again, I was like, wow, this is, a, this is a revolutionary moment. Like, I could just see, like, if we could just get this into America, like, and a lot of people felt that way, too. Um, and so what we did at Adbusters is we wrote a, um, what we called a tactical briefing, and we designed a poster. And the tactical briefing was basically just, it's just an email. But the email said, you know, if we can combine what's happening in Egypt with this idea of going to a place of symbolic importance and making, like, a single demand, um, which for them was Mubarak must go, with this, what's happening in Spain, which is this kind of leaderless, consensus-based um, general assembly model, if we can combine those two, bring it to Wall Street, then we can basically kick off this revolution um, in America. And there's two things that are remarkable, remarkable about the origin of Occupy Wall Street. Um, number one thing is that almost everyone that I talked to, in fact, everyone that I talked to thought it was a terrible idea and that it would not happen. So that's the first thing that we're gonna go on a mind journey about activism, but the first thing that I wanna point out is that the, the remarkable thing about activism as a social phenomenon is that most people are very, very bad at predicting which social movements or social protests are likely to take off. It's not something like science where people can say, well, I know that water boils at this temperature, like it's gonna re, no. In fact, even experienced activists are very bad at predicting when or what kind of behaviors will, will lead to these things erupting. So everyone told me it was a terrible idea, and the mainstream, like, progressive left didn't want to cover it and all this kind of stuff. But there were, like, as soon as we sent out the email, there was about 
something like 200 people in New York City who did think it was a great idea. And they were like these kind of outsider activists and they ended up being the ones who, you know, um, organized the first day of the protest. So there's still a lot of controversy around the creation of Occupy Wall Street. I still get people telling me, you didn't create Occupy Wall Street. And I'm like, okay, like, um, I did and I, I co-created in the sense with Kala because we were the first person who came up with the idea. We created the first Twitter account. I, fr I sent the first Twitter hashtag. We picked the date, the tactic, a lot of, we framed the whole protest, all this kind of stuff. But obviously, yes, I didn't even go to New York City. This is the very nature of contemporary social movements. I did not go to New York City. So you have people in New York City like, he didn't create the movement, he was never here. And I'm like, absolutely, you're absolutely right. I never went to New York City. But the idea and all of these, the parameters came from from somewhere else. And precisely another thing that's interesting is um, Adbus is a Canadian magazine. So this movement that Occupy, which is known as such an American phenomenon, actually took a spark from outside of the country, a Canadian magazine to get started. And we can talk about why, but it has a lot to do with American activist culture. So that's just a brief capsule of the story of Occupy. And if you have questions about it, we can get into it. Um, it's now nine years, so I think it's important to just, let's just keep moving forward. So the most important thing though is that Occupy, for those who experienced it, was beautiful. It was amazing, okay? It spread to 82 countries and 1,000 cities. In many ways, it was the perfect social movement. I say this as someone who, from the age of 13, was dreaming about being part of something like Occupy Wall Street, where you have millions of people around the world, largely nonviolent, united behind a message, demanding change, et cetera. Um, but it failed. It, it was defeated. Um, and in that defeat, you know, that triggered a kind of period of sustained self-reflection about activism for me. Because I thought it was very, um, I mean, everyone, I think a lot of people who are intimately involved in Occupy felt like that was a traumatic experience because even though now in this world it seems impossible, but at that time, we really did believe we were on the brink of a revolution in America because, because there was revolutions going across the world. Like the Arab Spring was toppling people who seemed just as entrenched as American as, as, as the you know, moneyed elites who, who control American politics, Mubarak seemed just as, and he, and he fell. So in the traumatic collapse of the movement, most of the movement, and this is where a lot of the kind of disagreements continue to this day, most of the movement, almost all of the movement, went in the direction of Occupy was a, was a success, let's double down on street protest, let's like go into Black Lives Matter, and let's do more street protests. Like they didn't, like in some ways it was almost like you guys weren't disruptive enough, right? <laughs> and it's like, so they like started blocking more traffic and, and, then, and then we've seen a succession of movements. But my response was different. I, I was like, well, why didn't it work? I don't understand, like I didn't understand. I literally didn't understand. And the, and the theories of failure just felt so insufficient. So there's some theories like um, you, didn't have a, you didn't have a clear demand, the police repression, all of these things that we can talk about later why, but all these things didn't, didn't to me speak the truth about why the movement didn't work. Um, and so I moved to rural Oregon and I wrote this book, The End of Protests, which you can read. But the, the main kind of message of that book was the, and this is the first kind of answer I came to, is that Occupy failed, I think, in some ways, I call it a constructive failure because it taught us something about activism, but in some ways because we had a limited understanding of what creates social change. So this is like the second idea that I want to get across, okay? So we're going to just dwell for a minute on this, on, this nat on this concept. Like, what is it that causes social change, okay? So activism, I call myself an activist. A lot of people call themselves activists today. When I started doing activism when I was 13, no one, no one like, wanted to be an activist. It wasn't cool. It's great that there's a lot of activists now, but um, when activism, activism is a, is a really recent phenomenon. So if you look at, like, where this idea of activism comes from, the essential idea of activism is something like that people can influence the course of history, right? And this, that generally speaking is, a, is actually a relatively new idea that's a, mo it's a modern idea. Like if you look at like um, Plato's theory of how tyranny, you know, uh, democracies become tyrannies and all this kind of the, this stuff, it has always to do with the, the factions, factions within the elite, the governing elite. That's been the, the dominant theory of how social change happens is that it happens at the top. Activists starting you know, with the French Revolution, American Revolution, et cetera, and like really crystallized with um, like Trotsky and Lenin, all these people, started to argue instead that the, that the peoples were the drivers of change and that the people had this capacity to like, create social change. So the dominant, you know, the dominant understanding of, well, how do activists do that? So if we believe that activists and people, which I do believe, have the capacity to create social change, well, how do they do that? So there's, I argue there's four basic ways of understanding it, okay? So the first one, if you think about, visualize it, is that there's a graph, and on the bottom are theories of change that say 
that revolution is a process involving the material world around us. On the top are theories of change that say that revolution is a process involving the immaterial or the spiritual world. On the left are theories that say that it's a process involving humans. And on the right are theories that say it's a process that doesn't involve humans. So we're going to go through each of these four possibilities really quickly. Um, and so basically, let's start with the bottom left-hand corner. This is the most common theory of, of social activism, the common theory of how social change happens. And it's called voluntarism. And it basically says that social change is the result of humans acting on their material environment. Right? So if I want to create change in my community, then I need to define the collective behavior that people need to do and then get lots of people to do it. This is like the ba this is basic, that is activism 101. All four of these theories are true, by the way. I'm not saying they're all true. Um, the problem is that we sometimes overemphasize certain ones and they exclude the other ones. So this is, you know, just, you know, we all are familiar, we're activists, we're familiar with this, but a really clear example is like in environmental activism, climate activism, you know, like there's people who would argue like the number one thing we can do is like go out and block that oil pipeline. Stop, like use our bodies to stop the flow of the oil. That's how we create social change. That would be an example of voluntarism. Or we need to organize 100 million people in the streets marching or whatever. That's voluntarism. Okay, so that, yes, it's true, but there's other theories. Let's go through the other theories now. And we're gonna go from uh, easy to hard to accept. And eventually everyone will be uh, provoked. Okay, here we go. So that one, we can all agree, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Let's just quibble about how we do the action, you know? Um, okay, so number two theory, if you go to the, the right, bottom right-handed corner, it says that revolution is a process involving the material world, but not humans not their human action. So that's called structuralism. That's the idea that, that revolution and periods of social change are really the result of like, economic factors. Okay? This is very common with like, Marxist historical materialism. Um, the updated version of this is there's actually been some really compelling um, scientific research around food prices. So for example, like, once food prices pass a certain threshold, there's been studies that have in, uh, argued that uh, social change is more likely to occur. So with the Arab Spring and Occupy, food prices happened to crest this. What's interesting is the scientists actually argued this, and they said, look, the food prices are going up. Better be careful. And then the, Arab and then the food prices crossed the threshold, and then the Arab Spring happened and totally validated their theory. But what's interesting about the food price thing is that um, food prices are influenced sometimes, at least in the Arab Spring, they're influenced by like, climate, for example, or forces that are not directly um, under human control. Like there was a, some hurricane or something that hit like the Australia influencing sugar prices or something like that. So, so, there's, so with structuralism, the argument is like, you can't have periods of dramatic social change without these structural, either whether it's not like, whether it's large unemployment or an economic crisis or food prices or whatever, but it's things that we can't control, basically. I think that, I think we can all kind of understand that a little bit. So now we're gonna go to another level. So number three is this idea that social change is, is the result of, of humans working on the immaterial, the non-material world. So what does that look like? Well, that would be called subjectivism. This is the idea that basically our inner world, is, that, our, that external reality is a manifestation of our inner reality, okay? And so if we wanna change external reality, we have to really focus on changing our, changing our inner reality. This, this again, I think some activists, we kind of know this, I mean meditation, you know, in Occupy there's all these, there's Occupy meditation tents and all this kind of stuff, we kind of get this. But there's, I think the best articulation, if you want to dig into this particular one, the best articulation is um, A Course in Miracles. Has anyone read A Course in Miracles? Okay. A Course in Miracles is like a secret cult book that everyone should take a look at. If you haven't read A Course in Miracles, you should read A Course in Miracles. Anyways, A Course in, Mir a Course in Miracles is a book that was um, dictated by a spirit to a woman who spoke the words and it's recorded by another person who's typing it up. Um, and it's, it's, it's largely a, um, a theorization of this concept of external reality is dependent on internal reality, so change your internal reality to change your external reality. And I think there's something interesting here about um, apocalyptic climate narratives and how if, if subjectivism is true or what, to what degree is it true, apocalyptic climate narratives could be detrimental and stuff like that. So there's something interesting there too. Okay. Now the fourth, the fourth is the one that is the disavowed corner. This is the corner that we're not allowed to think about as being possible and not allowed to discuss. It's the idea that revolution is a process not involving humans and not involving uh, the material world. That is like a supernatural phenomenon. So what would this mean? 
Well, there's two examples that I think are really helpful. First and most, um, you know, the biggest and easiest to think about is uh, Christianity. Christianity. So if you think about Christianity, which is, Christianity is like one of the most, all, I mean, all the world religions are a fascinating study in, in social movements. Um, but the thing about Christianity that is particularly remarkable is that Christianity was the only belief system um, that was outlawed in uh, ancient Rome. So you think about this. So you could, believe, you could believe anything. I mean, it was a pagan society. You could worship any god you wanted, except you couldn't be a Christian. And there was a long period of time, like basically 300 years of persecution of the Christians. And to the point where we all famously you know, have heard the stories, like they would just throw Christians into uh, the ring and people would cheer while the Christians were eaten by wild animals. Okay, so, so imagine you're an activist and that's the level of repression that you are facing. And then within a generation, you become the only allowed religion and all of pagans are outlawed. Wow, how did that happen, right? <laughs> That's an amazing story. How did that happen? Did the, did the Christians march in the streets and organize protests? No, they did not. Did they, you know, no, they did not do any of that stuff. Instead, and this is you know, arguable based on your understanding of the history of theology and whatever, but the case can be made that it really was the result of two people having dreams. Um, and the most important person being Constantine the Great, right? So the story is that Constantine the Great in 312 AD is marching to battle against a rival emperor um, and he sees first this like thing in the sky and all of his army sees it too. That night he has a dream where this like, you know, shadowy figure is talking to him and tells him that if you put that symbol on your shield, you'll, you will win. He wakes up, he tells his advisors about his dream and they're like, well, that was Jesus Christ, you know. He wins the battle, boom. He says the official religion of Rome of, is now Christianity, right? So. The point here is that there is something interesting to be said about, and I think one way you could interpret this in a secular perspective, actually Marx, I mean, sorry, Engels has written about um, the conquest of Christianity, and he comes up with a materialist uh, interpretation because he wants to reject a spirit supernatural. He basically argues like, oh, it's because all the soldiers were already Christians, like he has this alternate interpretation. But beside that, I think what's interesting instead is that I think Christianity, what they were doing is they were excelling at a kind of prophetic narrative that induced visions of Jesus in people, basically, right? They like had some sort of ideology that, that induced people to dream about Jesus. And then when those people dreamed about Jesus, they ended up like believing and following that prophetic narrative. It's just a different perspective on activism. Okay, so that's the four theories of activism. And I think that those largely contain all of the different, basically, ways that we can be activists. Um, and, and, the, and what I'm trying to say is that it's all about the proper mixture of them. So like for the Marxist, Marxist materialists, they were probably right to be focusing on a, a voluntarist, structuralist interpretation of how to achieve revolution. You know, Lenin, Lenin comes out of the, the first failed revolution, and he's like, armed insurrection. You know, like, organize the people. Like, he had a very, like, voluntarist and structuralist interpretation. But now we live in 2020, and voluntarism seems to be very weak. It seems, I mean, looking at, for example, countries like China, which we'll talk about later, they're very well equipped to um, neutralize street protests. There's not even street protests in China. If our government wanted there to be no street protests, there would also be no street protests. Um, so voluntarism is particularly weak in this particular time. So the first, so that's, that's part one. So the first thing I did is I kind of like went through and I was like, okay, like Occupy failed because we had a broken theory of change. I started to think about maybe also we failed because of, um, you know, broken strategy. I started to advocate for, for trying to win elections and gain, gaining sovereignty and all this kind of stuff. But then, you know, about, um, it, started, it started actually when I, I taught this, um, this class at um, Bard uh, with my wife on, on activism. And we had this one class on the future of activism. And I came across this really interesting report by um, the US government's like intelligence council. So every four years, Congress has mandated that the like intelligence council or whatever, the, the intelligence community in the US government has to come out with this report kind of about the future of power and like and the, a trend, it's like a trends report, global trends report, I think is what it's called. So last, the last report came out in 2017 and I, and, I, and I used it in our class on activism because the whole thing is about the changing nature of power. It's super interesting. And what they say is, this really like opened my eyes up to, the, to, to an important thing and ultimately led to me going to Davos. What they said is that the nature of power is changing 
and it's no longer sufficient to be the ma most materially, materially powerful or have the strongest army or have the most money. You also have to now have power in outcome, and which they defined as basically the capacity to mobilize people. So you have to be both materially powerful, but also you have to have the power, the power to mobilize people. Now, right now, we're seeing China unbelievable power in outcome, right? They're like, hospital in 10 days, boom, hospital in 10 days. Um, and so that you can see the power, manifestation of the power, which is something that I think also in, in that, we're, that we're still grappling with in America, um, which also I think is something that Trump kind of is, is getting at with his rallies. But anyways, the point here is this, this power and outcome. And they actually mention activists in this report. This is like a super high level intelligence report. They mention activists and they talk about how activists are going to ha have more power than they used to because of their ability to basically not only mobilize, but also like disruption, all this kind of stuff. So this led to a whole kind of shift in my thinking around the question of Occupy Wall Street and what was Occupy Wall Street and, and why did Occupy Wall Street fail? And I started to see that the, for the, the real question, this is all happening within the last year, the real question is not why did Occupy fail, but what can something like Occupy Wall Street be used to achieve? And okay, and this is, what, this is what, I'm, what I'm trying to say here is, and this is like the third point I want to talk about basically is, is, a sh is changing our understanding of what social activism is and what social movements are, okay? So our base understanding, our first understanding of social movements and social activism, which I myself have held for many years, is that social movements are the manifestation of uh, discontent among the people. And the reason why that they are protesting is because of the grievance that they have. So. The reason why we went into the streets uh, against the war in 2003 is because we were against the war. You know, um, I think that is possibly true, but I think that there's something more, more something also going on that's even more interesting and more, that activists need to be tuned into, which is that social protests also seem to be something that's um, a deeply human social phenomenon that serves a kind of social evolutionary function. So this is what I mean by that: is that if you look at human history, we actually have records all the way back to ancient Egypt 5,000 years ago, documenting people overthrowing uh, kings. Okay, so, for the, so we know that for the last 5,000 years, every generation or two, or sometimes even more frequently, there's this sudden like um, manifestation of the people into the streets, and it's an opportunity, not always taken by society, but it's an opportunity for society to make these, these dramatic social changes. And if you look at the social changes that we you know, all of the things that we like about democracy are the real result of these kind of social protests. And so I started to think about Occupy not in its failure that we did, not that, not in its failure, but what could it have been used for. And I started to, I started to think, appreciate, the thing about Occupy so I started to appreciate is that it's actually a really, it's a very remarkable thing, if you think about it, that an idea that spread from two people to 200 people then to 82 countries in 1,000 cities with millions of people involved, without any sort of leaders, without any really funding. I mean, it costs like almost nothing to create. Um, and it spread to those 82 countries in about three weeks. And it got people to do wildly new behaviors. I mean, people quit their jobs, they got arrested, they had <laughs> bones broken, people had babies like in encampments, like people transformed their lives because of Occupy Wall Street. Um, and that seems to be something that's magical and unique and needs to be put to good use, right? Like there's something, there's beyond just protesting. Like I think what part of the mistake is, I understood Occupy Wall Street as a protest. But what if it's not a protest, what's important about it is more that it's a, that it's a social mobilization, okay? So my thinking a lot right now is moving from social activism to social mobilization. And, and the point and the connection here is that as we move forward into this, this world, this scary world that we're entering, activism and, and the capacity of activists to mobilize people is becoming crucial to the functioning of power and solving the problems in which we face. So this is, this is the argument that I, um, that I ended up writing for the World Economic Forum. Uh, and so I'll pause here, talk about the World Economic Forum briefly. Um, so the argument I made was basically that elites need activists and now activists also need elites. Um, and it has to do with the fact that the challenges that we face as people are no longer primar primarily political, they're really existential. And, and at the time I was writing about climate, but now we can see it with coronavirus as well, right? We can see that like the actual challenges that are, that are threatening all of us 
it's not really a political question. Like having a different president isn't going to necessarily mitigate coronavirus, right? It's an existential threat that, that attacks all of us. And if we, want to if we want to, for example, mitigate climate change, we're going to have to work with elites. This is, the, this is a really hard thing to accept because working with elites on both sides takes um, sacrifices. So, so the changing nature of power, I made this argument in, a, in an article for, for the World Economic Forum, and then they, um, they invited me to go to, the, to Davos. Um, and when I first got the invite, there's like a, such a cultural clash between the way that they communicate and the way that I'm used to communicating. I literally thought it was a, I thought it was a spam email at first because I was like, this email is just something's off about it. And they're like, no. And they're like, no, no. Can we, we didn't hear from you. Can we talk on the phone? And I was like, oh, I thought that I thought that was a spam email. I didn't understand. No, no, it's real. Are you good? Can you come to this? Can you come to this? And I told them instantly. I was like, look, if I go to the World Economic Forum, it's a reputational suicide because. Like, flat out, because I, in 2002, was almost arrested protesting against the World Economic Forum in New York City. Being against the World Economic Forum is part of the orthodoxy of the left. We're supposed to hate them. They're horrible. They're the enemy. Um, and so I told them it would be reputational suicide to do that. But at the same time, I felt compelled to do it because of this, because of this new understanding, which is basically, at the time I was really thinking about climate, but now I'm thinking a lot about coronavirus, but basically, um, if we're serious about mitigating climate change, it's going to require a, a large, like a mobilization on the scale of Occupy Wall Street, like times ten, um, and that can only be achieved if if, if elites take a hands-off approach with activists. So the World Economic Forum is a gathering. It's in, it's crazy, and I haven't even finished processing. I only got back two weeks ago. I'm still like trying to process how weird it was. But basically, it's this super elite, um, very exclusive gathering, and it, to to get a ticket is almost impossible. I never even thought that I would get invited or whatever. But so there's two kinds of people. There's many kinds of people who go, but mostly they're corporations, um, government leaders, and civil society. And I was going to represent this thing that I was arguing called uncivil society, the social protests, the social movements that they're unable to kind of talk to. Like Greenpeace goes every year, but Greenpeace isn't able to create the mass mobilization that, um, that they need. So they're looking for these activists. And you know, it's almost like the experience is a little bit like going to North Korea because everyone, so the, the World Economic Forum is like an organization with 800 employees and they, everyone who goes to this event has like a, not a minder, but a contact person who, who personalizes their experience. So, so the experience that I received at Davos, I will say is obviously much different than the experience I would have received if I was you know, the CEO of Coca-Cola or, I don't know if the CEO of Coca-Cola was there, but. Whatever, CEO of Nestle, he was there, okay. Um, very different experiences, down to the point where you wear a badge the entire time and the badge gives you access to these rooms. So there's all whole rooms that I you know, couldn't go into, even though I had like, you know, an elite badge, I didn't have like, there's even a badge apparently that allows you to get access to the, the helicopter pad. You know, like there's just, it's like all, like it basically it goes as high as you want into the stratosphere of insanity. And then there's like this con Congress Center and in order to get in there it's like, that's where the conference is. It's like an airport level security. It's like insane. And then outside of that is this town in Switzerland where the corporations, in order to um, hopefully meet with these people who are going to this conference, they buy up for that week only all of the buildings within like a mile radius. And they, they either build new buildings, which is amazing, or they just plaster over the sign and put up new signs. Like this is now Facebook, Palantir, Microsoft, all, the corpor all these crazy corporations. Philip Morris. First day I was there, someone was like, oh my gosh, did you see Sheryl Crow was singing at the Philip Morris building down the street? And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so it's all these kind of like hidden exclusive parties that I wasn't invited to, but if you're like, you know, this, it's all a whole thing. Um, but while I was there, the most important thing and the most interesting thing about the World Economic Forum is that they were, they were nice enough to actually organize this meeting between like industry, corporations, and activists around this question of could we have some sort of what I was calling like a united front. So this meeting was really interesting, actually, because they had, it was Chatham House Rules, which is like, means that I'm not supposed to tell you who was there, but I can tell you what was said. Okay. So they had these corporations represented in the room. The corporations had a combined employees of 500,000, 500,000 employees. They had a union in there. The union represented like people in 38 countries, like millions of people. Um, it's insane. That's the thing about the World Economic Forum is they have a lot of convening power, they super high level. And so I presented this idea of like, 
I called it an alliance of opposites. Basically, you know, if we want to do um, large scale climate mobilization and we know that we need to work together, what would be the, what would be the terms of uh, the agreement that we'd have to come to, for example? Um, and I think it basically comes down to, on the one hand, um, activists have to break with 300 years of activist strategy, which has been class war and uh, gaining political power, right? Put those on the back burner for, because we have 10 years to mitigate climate before we all have entered in and, you know, whatever, unstoppable climate change. But for, so for 10 years, activists would say, would voluntarily say, okay, any government who's, or, or corporation who's part of this united front, we will put aside our strategy for the last 300 years of, of political revolution in order to mobilize, using our unique capacity as activists to mobilize. What do elites and power, powerful people have to give up is their, is their obsession with, with um, suppressing protest. The main thing to get across to them is that protests actually are socially useful and they're doing us all a disservice by crushing them too early. We need them to grow. Um, and so I presented this idea let me just also say one more thing about it, is that a united front, I use this term specifically because for those of us who are, you know, if you're interested in the history of revolution, this is a very specific term within the activist um, uh, culture, um, which is that it's not the same as saying, an it's not the same as saying a coalition, you know, sometimes when we talk about coalitions, coalitions often involve people trying to act the same. A united front is specifically in a, a situation in which adversaries work together to defeat an, uh, an enemy and achieve uh, a shared enemy and achieve a greater goal. And then hostilities resume, okay? So the best example of this is the um, Chinese communists under Mao formed a united front with the Chinese nationalists to defeat Japanese imperialism. They did defeat, defeat Japanese imperialism and then the Chinese communists still won. So this is, a united front does not mean I'm saying activists are gonna lose, we need to change our, no, no. It just means that temporarily, yes, we're working with people that we say are also still our enemies in this world that we're trying to create. Um, okay, so the response from industry was that the idea that they were, so there was a lot of hunger in the room. People really liked the conversation. It was very interesting, actually. They were so interested in talking about this. Um, the, the corporations felt like, on the one hand, what's going on in the, in the in, to give you the mindset of the corporations right now, is that they have all these employees who want to be activists. <laughs> and this is presenting a real problem for them because they need to, you know, in order to have like an efficient workforce, you can't just have these dissatisfied people. So they're actually like, these, this one company has like 250,000 employees and they're talking about how they're gonna to have to like offer like activism trainings, you know, because these, their employees want to be in a socially forward looking of company with values, right? So they, they feel the pressure to, to allow activism to exist but they have a lot of hesitation around, well, what does it have to look like? Like they want a kind of activism that's very clean, gentle, no disruptions. And I'm like, no, 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 during this mobilization for climate, we're gonna be like planting trees, but also blocking airports. Like it's gonna be messy because social movements actually progress through that kind of chaotic, uncertain um, feelings, right? They were uncomfortable with that part of it. The activists were uncomfortable with this idea of um, basically putting aside class war. Right? They're like, no, we can't solve climate change until we solve income inequality. Income inequality is the first thing we have to solve. Which, look, I loved that argument 10 years ago or five years ago, but if it is true that we only have 10 years left, I can definitely see the strategy of pursuing income inequality first, solving that one first before we do climate, as like a suicidal gesture on the part of activists. Because we could waste, we could spend 10 years, and we might, my experience with Occupy Wall Street is, it's possible, yeah, for sure, it's possible. We could create a massive movement and all of a sudden overthrow Western governments. And, and then we get there and then we realize, oh crap, it's too late to do that mobilization <laughs> that we needed to do for climate. So this is the difficult thing, is I feel like we're being forced into a situation of having to choose, basically. And I think the activists don't wanna make that choice. They wanna pursue the same strategy that we've been pursuing for a long time. Um, and that's really hard, so let's see. So I believe we need a, yeah, we need a new, a new strategy. I'm calling it kind of a united front. After Davos, I went to uh, London to meet with the founders of Extinction Rebellion, which I think is one of the most interesting kind of climate activist movements out there. And they're in the middle of this kind of um, strategy, trying to think about their strategy going forward. Um, and I'm really advocating for this idea of a trillion tree campaign. We can talk about that later, but um, it was very interesting to talk with them about whether, how, if they would be open to it and all this kind of stuff in the United Front. 
Um, we will see. But then, of course, on the, plane, on the plane back is when the coronavirus starts hitting. I want to end with the coronavirus, because I've been thinking about the coronavirus so much. It's like, I, I'm sure a lot of people are also kind of thinking about it. But what's so interesting about the coronavirus is that, I mean, it really is the, in a certain sense, it's, I got interested because I'm interested in um, social contagion. Like, Occupy was a kind of social contagion, a kind of virus as well. But the thing about the coronavirus is, is it's actually a virus that also targets our capacity as activists. Because we can't organize mobilizations if we're afraid of getting infected. Like in China, they've banned large-scale gatherings, right? And that same thing's happened in the UK, just declared an emergency. So it's like activism is actually under threat, um, or at least activism as we've been doing it is under threat from this virus. And it's again, another the reason why I'm so fascinated is it's another warning call to activists that we have to rethink our strategy. Climate was, I think, a, is a huge warning. Coronavirus is another wake-up call. Like if we persist in, in believing that, um, that we will you know, basically keep doing these large-scale mass mobilization marches and this kind of stuff is how we're going to create change. There are all these forces that are, I think, are trying to tell us, no, we need something else. We need to rethink this and this kind of stuff. So that's kind of like um, where I wanted to end. Um, really with this, you know, I was telling my wife today, like, I'm just really thinking a lot about shifting. I've always think, seen myself as an activist, and now I'm really starting to shift from thinking about social activism to social mobilization. And starting to understand that, like, really, I think that the the real um, power of of organizing and activism, et cetera, is that we're one of the few social forces who has the proven capacity to get people all over the world to suddenly change their behaviors. Like, that's that's our unique gift, and we can achieve things. I would argue that are perhaps even higher than uh, you know the theorists of activist strategy, Marx and Engels, and political revolution um, imagined. So I think that's what I dream of. I dream of some kind of like, you know, massive mobilization that suspends the status quo and allows us to accomplish great things in a very short amount of time. But I also see that that is now under threat from all these kind of forces like coronavirus and, and other things like that. So thank you all for listening. I hope that was... <laughs> We're going to...